the lines between science and myth are not as clearly defined as many of us would often like to believe. Myths, as they're commonly understood, are a form of crutch used to explain away phenomena that are, at the time, unexplainable. This mode of thought can be best exemplified by a tribesman who blows smoke onto a beehive while simultaneously holding a talisman, a magic stick, and maybe even chanting an incantation. We know, in our post-enlightenment conception of the world, that the talisman is superfluous and pleonastic, and the smoke is the actual reason for the beast's disperse. The idea that items with a mythical function are useless is, however, inherently flawed. An example where a magical item called a marked benefit is the case of Vikings and their use of spirit bones. The Vikings, or more accurately, the ancient Scandinavians, believed that bones of animals contain the soul and power of the beast they belong to. This power could be harnessed by casting the bones into the forge which contained the molten iron. This process worked, the iron became stronger than if the mythological aspect had not been performed. In actuality, the carbon from the bone entered the iron forming an alloy, which is better known as steel. These large carbon atoms, in simplistic terms, reinforce the iron and cause it to be stronger. This change in strength likely led to experimentation and an understanding of which bones to add and by what amount and when during the forging process, which led to a greater understanding of how to make better steel. Perhaps it could be argued that the spiritual aspect was a crutch, but where does a crutch end? If the end product can be achieved by combining a defined set of components that function predictably each time and each component is understood and can be independently changed to optimize the end product, is this not a type of science? This form of science is known as a proto-science, as it has the hallmarks of science, yet it does not have a complete understanding of the mechanisms at play. Even today, industries seek to streamline output and oftentimes unnecessary steps are only noticed and removed after much experimentation. We have just had more time to remove the spiritual aspect from this production. Other times, the matter of myths is a matter of corrupted or misunderstood truth. This can be exemplified in the tale of the Moai, or as they're better known, the Easter Island statues. The statues of Rapa Nui are immense, with some examples standing 10 meters tall and weighing 82 tons. These statues are carved from a single piece of volcanic ash and transported across the island from the volcanic crater on the coast. Moving such immense statues would be a feat for us today with our powerful diesel-driven machines. So how did the natives do this so long ago? The Dutch asked the same question when they landed ashore on Easter Sunday in 1722. The natives candidly described the process, explaining how the Moai walked from the quarry to the edge of the island. This was viewed as nothing more than myth for hundreds of years, until it was noticed by researchers that the megaliths had all landed face first on hills, sloping downwards relative to the quarry from whence the statues came. These researchers then tried swaying the statues to and fro and managed to move the statue approximately 100 meters in an hour. The island, being only 24 kilometers across, would imply that one could move any moai to any part of the island in a reasonable amount of time with manpower alone. Some myths, however, have yet to be confirmed with modern science and rationality, yet there are fairly convincing accounts describing phenomenon. In many ancient texts, such as the Babylonian Talmud, the Vedas of India, and even accounts from the Codices of Mesoamerica, there are tales of plants being used to carve rock, dissolve metal, and even bore holes through glass. The Talmud describes how Shamir was passed over the ink on the tables of the law to engrave them. This, in my mind, evokes images of photo etching, the technique that was used to produce the world's first photograph, which was originally done by using bitumen of Judea to etch a pewter plate. In Egypt, there is a similar tale that's told of Shamir being used to soften the pyramids. In even more of the Jewish myths, there is said to be a cockerel that used Shamir to dissolve holes into a piece of glass that was placed upon its nest. For comparison, in Peru, 
There is a myth that a bird melted a slab of iron with pito, a herb claimed by Peruvians to be used in the construction of their temples and buildings as it helped them to soften the stone. In ancient Cambodia, there are tales that the intricate patterns on the idols and Angkor Wat were produced by smearing a similar plant across the surface and then using a stylus to produce markings. This was also used to produce peculiar shaped stones that appear to be melted on a few of the Southeast Asian ziggurats. Considering there are so many accounts from across the globe, it doesn't seem too improbable that such a technique could be real. Yet perhaps, like the situation in the Moai and their walking, we just haven't understood the bigger picture of the myth yet. I postulated earlier that Shamir or Pito may have been used as a form of photo etching that burnt design into the surface. I think this may have been used as a way of printing a design onto the surface and then aided with the carving of it, not necessarily melting it. But who knows, I don't want to be naive when so many people are saying the same thing. The final stage of this way of thinking would be the tentative steps into empirical science. This nascent way of thinking was prevalent in the proto-sciences of the Ayurvedic, Chinese and Western understanding of medicine until relatively recently in the form of humours. The Ayurvedic and Western conception of the humours were staggeringly similar. This probably stems from the fact that both groups are Indo-Europeans and may have shared a conceptual strata to base their ideas upon. Both systems were based on the four principal elements, being fire, water, earth and air, and, if you prescribe the Ayurvedic mode of thinking, the additional element of space. These humours could, if unbalanced, lead to ailments that related to the specific type of disharmony that was playing out within the body. This sort of thinking can still be seen in traditional Chinese medicine, where herbs and animal parts are used to change the temperature and temperament of the blood. The rationale wasn't and isn't that unreasonable, and that is probably why it has endured for so long, and the reason why it took so long for alchemy to become chemistry. Despite being flawed, these pioneers in critical thinking and observation led to many components of these ancient medicines being isolated. We no longer need to tie a worm around our neck or chew a poppy to alleviate a sore throat. We just isolate the opiates and leave the worms in peace. Perhaps though, the magical element provides us with context for our actions and provides us with a sense of culture and warmth and belonging that utilitarianism and pure science cannot. After all, what would you prefer? Father Christmas being the one who delivers your presents and his elves in Lapland building the toys and gadgets, and the other option being it's just your father placing toys and gadgets under the Christmas tree which were made by child exploitation in China and Indonesia. I know I prefer to hear on Christmas. I hope you enjoy this episode. The next one coming is about aliens, which will be here on Friday. And next week, I'll start the series on mythological beings, which I think will be very fun and enjoyable. If you have any questions or found anything you don't agree with, leave it in the comments. If you liked it, like it. And please don't forget to subscribe. It really helps with the AI overlords.